Pilots, get ready to warp to the James Webb Telescope. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Mark McCochran. Good morning. Thank you. So it's my job this morning to take you back to real space from the space where you spend most of your lives, as far as I can tell. Um, I have a son who's about your age. I'm looking out. I'm guessing most of you are a bit younger than me. Um, but it's my job today to talk about a project which has actually taken a very long time. So when I started on this, I was just as young as you were. Um, and I'll show you some pictures at the end to demonstrate that. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's a joint project of NASA, the European Space Agency, who I work for, and the Canadian Space Agency. And I've been a member of the science working group, the science team for this mission, since 2002. And I started on the project in 1998. So a long time ago to get to this point where we are today, where finally this telescope is in orbit and taking science data. So let's see if we can make this machine work here. Maybe not. We're going to have the trouble right from the beginning. All right, we have a backup. Well, that doesn't work either. Do you have the right? No, this one is. Is your phone number? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be. Let me try again. It, it worked earlier. Just give us a moment, guys. All right, we'll go with that. So, on Christmas Day, 2021, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched into orbit um, on an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana. So the European Space Agency, one of its big contributions to this mission was the Ariane 5 rocket, and you can see it going into space here. But this story actually starts a long time before that. <sighs> Maybe if I go and stand all the way over here. Doesn't really matter where I stand on stage. There you go. So the story starts actually back here. This is in, the, um, in 1990. This is the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, which has now been in space for more than 33 years. And even before we launched Hubble in 1990, we knew that at some point we would need a new space telescope to do things that Hubble couldn't do. And so in the mid-1980s, up until 1989, a study was started to look at what we called then NGST, the Next Generation Space Telescope. So this conference took place in 1989, even before we launched the Hubble Space Telescope, and it took all of those years that Hubble has been operating to get to where we are today. So these are very long-term projects. But we can go back even further than that and think about what human beings can see in space with the naked eye. So this is a shot from a beach in New Zealand, and we can see the Milky Way, our galaxy, the one we live in, with roughly 200 billion stars. We can see the two external galaxies there on the left-hand side, large and small Magellanic clouds, which orbit around our Milky Way. And we can see with the naked eye about 6,000 stars over the whole sky. So it looks like there are many more in this picture. Of course, this is a photograph. It can capture fainter light than we can see with the naked eye. But astronomers are always greedy for more light. We always want to see fainter things. So over the years, we've invented machines called telescopes. So starting roughly 400 years ago with Galileo, we've built telescopes bigger and bigger, collecting more and more light to see fainter and fainter objects. And this picture here, shows you one of the biggest observatories in the world. This is called, and astronomers are boring, this is called the Very Large Telescope. Um, and this sits on a mountaintop in Chile at about uh, 2,500 meters. You can see some small telescopes there on the left-hand side, and this giant telescope there, which has a main collecting mirror eight meters across, so roughly the width of the stage here at the front. And with that, of course, we can collect much more light than the human eye can collect. But astronomers are even more greedy than that, because we not only have one of them. On the same mountaintop, we decided to build another one, and another one, 
It does stop soon. And another one. So there are four of these eight-meter telescopes which make up the very large telescope. And they can all be linked together underground. The light can be channeled. And we can actually collect the light from all of those, not only with more sensitivity to see fainter objects, but also we can link them up to, do, to get higher resolution, more detail on the objects. Now, this is a place where um, telescopes um, are sighted, especially if they want to work in the infrared or at millimeter wavelengths. This is the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So it's 4.2 kilometers altitude, and that puts you above most of the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere. And water vapor absorbs infrared light. That's why it's part of the greenhouse gas equation along with CO2. Water vapor absorbs the infrared, and you want to get above as much of it as you can in order to be able to see that radiation coming from space. And the telescope on the left-hand side, I'll come back to it right at the end, that's the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope. That's a four-meter-wide telescope, so very small by modern standards, but it's where I got my PhD thesis in the 1980s, and I'll come back to that right at the end. And just, you know, one of those geeky astronomer things, I got married on the summit of that mountain as well, because that's what astronomers do. So, even Mauna Kea, though, is not the perfect observational site for astronomers. Clouds very often go underneath um, because the big island sticking out in the Pacific, the clouds go below that altitude quite often, but not always. So there are times when there are clouds above you on Mauna Kea. And even when there are no clouds, I'm getting two clicks now, then there's a glow in the sky. Humans can't really see it, but our telescopes, because they're so sensitive, they capture so much light, they can see this reddish glow in the sky, and it's even brighter in the infrared. And what this glow is, is molecules at about 80 kilometers altitude made of one oxygen and one hydrogen. It's called the hydroxyl molecule, and that captures ultraviolet light during the daytime. And at night, it releases that energy in the form of a visible glow and an infrared glow. So if you're trying to see faint objects in space, of course, you're trying to look through all of that bright stuff in the foreground. It's a bit like me now. I can really not see the people at the back because I've got such a bright light in my face. If you turned that off, I would have a much clearer vision. And so that's, again, a problem with astronomy. You want to get rid of as much of the bright background so you can see these faint objects. Now, even if you manage to do that, then you have this to compete with on the Earth. And that's called what we call seeing. This is atmospheric turbulence, heat rising in the atmosphere, and that causes the refractive index of the atmosphere to change slightly from place to place. And if you look very carefully, you can see the moon is not just moving all in one direction at once to the left, then to the right. Bits of it are moving in different directions all over the place. Uh, the kind of a rubber sheeting there. And that means if I have a very bright a source I want to look at, which is a point of light, a distant star, it gets smeared out, it gets blurred into a, into a rounder circle. And that limits the resolution you can get from the Earth. We can correct some of that by using lasers. We can attach big lasers to our telescopes, shine them up to about 80 kilometers again, hit sodium atoms in the upper atmosphere, make artificial stars which then help us deform the telescope in a way which corrects the turbulence. So that's called laser guide star adaptive optics, and we use that for very small pieces of the sky where it works well. But again, it's not perfect across big areas of the sky which you want to survey. So in the end, you put telescopes in space. It's a lot more expensive. It takes a long time to develop them. But there are huge advantages to putting these big machines in space. This is the Hubble Space Telescope, which you see I showed you at the beginning, launched in uh, 1990. It's still in operation. It's had several missions over its lifetime, changing instruments, changing faulty parts, fixing the mirror, which was broken in the first place. Um, we're having fun this morning. Um, and has new solar panels and so on. So Hubble is still operational, but Hubble is a visible wavelength telescope. It focuses on the wavelengths you and I can see in this room. It goes into the ultraviolet and a little bit into the infrared, but it's not really a very good infrared telescope at all. And the reason for that is that this telescope is close to the Earth. You can see it's just at about 400 kilometers above the Earth. The Earth is heating the telescope from underneath. The sun is heating it from the other side. The whole telescope is about room temperature. We like to think that space is cold. Well, not if you're near a planet and not if you're near a star. It's actually about room temperature out there in space. You'll die for other reasons, but you won't die of cold. Um, 
So the telescope is heated up to 20 degrees, and that means that it's giving out light, not in the visible, it's dark in the visible, but it's giving out light in the infrared, heat radiation. And that means it has this bright background of emission, which makes it hard to see faint objects in the infrared. So it's not a very good infrared telescope at all. The other advantage of putting telescopes in space is that Earth's atmosphere, I told you it absorbs water, uh, water absorbs infrared light, but other molecules in the atmosphere absorb other kinds of light coming from space. And if you look on the left-hand side there, the atmosphere is completely opaque. You can't see through it at all at gamma ray wavelengths or X-rays. So if you want to do that kind of astronomy, you have to be in space. The same for the whole of the middle infrared between 100 micron wavelength and one millimeter. You pretty much have to be in space or on super high mountains with no water vapor at all. So Hubble works at visible wavelengths there, and you see just to the left, that's the infrared where the James Webb Space Telescope works. So we have all of these different missions in space which operate at different wavelengths. And JWST was designed to fit in at the red end of the optical, the visible that we can see, all the way out to wavelengths about 50 or 60 times longer than that. And you can see some of that you can see from the ground. Some of those photons make it down to the ground, but many of them don't. And with JWST, we get rid of all of those barriers at different wavelengths. Now, one of the most famous pictures ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a very tiny piece of the sky. It's about the size of a piece of rice held at the end of your, your arm. So it's a very small area on the sky, and the Hubble pointed at it for around about a month, taking images every few minutes, and you add the images together, you stack them up, and at the end of the month, you get this view, which is seeing galaxies, very few stars in our Milky Way, because we're looking at a tiny piece of the sky, but beyond that, there are galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. And you see some of the big ones in the foreground, the big spirals and ellipticals, and then the galaxies get a bit smaller. There's plenty of smaller galaxies, and there's plenty of points of light in there. So we're seeing galaxies further and further away, the fainter they get. But here's the critical thing. We're not just seeing them further away, we're seeing them further back in time. Because the further away we look, the longer it has taken light to reach us, and some of the galaxies in here, the light has been traveling for 10 billion years before it gets to our telescope. And those are the smallest points of light in this picture. Now, here's the thing. We know that the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. There are many reasons we know that, many measurements with different kinds of telescopes. We know there is a wall. We cannot see further away than 13.8 billion years into the past. Hubble has seen about 10 billion, 11 billion years, and at that distance, or that time in the past, there are galaxies everywhere. So the question is, when did the first galaxies actually form? When did the first stars form? When did the first galaxies form? Hubble will never see them. Hubble cannot see them, even if it spends a year or 100 years observing. And the reason for that is what we call redshift. So as the universe is, we see further and further away, we also know that the universe is expanding. Every day, every second, every year, it gets bigger and bigger. Those galaxies are effectively moving away from us. They're attached to space-time, and as space-time stretches out in the expansion of the universe, the galaxies move away, and they move away, in a, in a sense, faster and faster and faster, the further they are away from us. And the phenomenon of redshift says that the faster something is moving away from you, the more its light gets moved to red wavelengths. We know this from sound. If an ambulance comes towards you along the street and it's moving towards you, it's blue shifted. The notes go up to a higher frequency. And when it goes away from you, the note drops and it goes to a lower frequency. That's called Doppler shift. The same thing happens with light. So when you go further and further back in time in the universe, those galaxies are further away, moving faster away, and the light is redshifted to longer wavelengths. So what we call redshift three, and I'll say what this means in a moment, you see the light has moved from visible wavelengths into the near infrared. And if we go to redshift of 10, which is where Hubble can see, there's only a tiny amount of light left at visible wavelengths. All that light has gone to the infrared now. And just to show you what that means in terms of age, 
Redshift of 10 is 13.2 billion years ago in the past. So there's still 600 million years since the beginning of the universe and what Hubble can see. And somewhere in that gap, the first galaxies formed. So you need an infrared telescope to see them. You need a telescope that can see at those wavelengths where that curve is now and beyond. And that's one of the reasons for the James Webb Space Telescope. Those objects also get a lot fainter because the further away they are, the dimmer the light. And when you add that factor in, then these galaxies get incredibly faint. On the axis, on the y-axis, these are factors of 100,000 in each step. So they're incredibly faint, these objects. So you need a much bigger telescope than Hubble to see them as well. You need an infrared telescope and a much bigger one. Now, once you have that, you can do all other kind of astronomy. So one of the other things that affects where the light comes out is the temperature of the object. The surface of, an, of a fairly average star, a bit dimmer than the sun, would be at about 3,000 Kelvin, 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And that puts most of its light out at visible and red wavelengths. But if you go to longer wavelengths, so 300 Kelvin, for example, is the temperature we're all at in the room here, around uh, 200, Zero Kelvin is two, minus 273 degrees centigrade. So you just add on what your temperature is in centigrade, then you get your absolute temperature. So we're around 300 Kelvin. And all of our light is coming out in the infrared. I mean, I can just about see you with reflected visible light, but if I was a snake and I had infrared vision, which they do, you'd be glowing in the room and I would be running in your direction to have lunch. And then you can get down to much, much lower temperatures you see here. But once you can see things at, say, 1,000 Kelvin or 300 Kelvin, you're looking at stars before they were born, stars before they heat up. So the process of star formation and planet formation is most naturally done in the infrared, where these objects are still young and only just warming up at the beginning of their lives. So this is another good reason to build a big infrared telescope. And here's a sort of demonstration. There are some unfortunate people on the left-hand side there being, who have been seen by a snake and will not last much longer. Um, now, the other thing is, as I said before, if you want to make sure you can see these wavelengths from space, from the objects out at a great distance, you need to make sure your telescope is not emitting light at the same wavelength. Again, Hubble is around that temperature. Hubble will just be blinded if it tries to look at faint light in the infrared. So the way you get over that is you cool the telescope down. So the James Webb Space Telescope is designed to be cooled to minus 233 degrees centigrade. So it's not giving any light out at these wavelengths. So it's a very different kind of telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope. And then one last real advantage of looking in the infrared is that dust, which is in the regions where stars and planets are being born, they're being made from gas and dust, dust absorbs infrared light very effectively. So this is the famous Orion Nebula, which I'll come back to at the end. This is a visible light picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. If you look at infrared wavelengths from the ground, then you see many more stars in there. They're hidden away in the visible because of all of that gas and dust. But when you go to the infrared, suddenly you can see cooler objects and objects which are hidden by dust. And so that's another reason we want to work in the infrared. And if you can work in the infrared, you can also start measuring the atmospheres of planets going around other stars. So we're not just interested with the James Webb Space Telescope in taking pictures of things, but also measuring their properties, the chemistry, the physics, um, and maybe even the biology, because we can do spectroscopy. We can split the light out in different wavelengths and actually start measuring compounds in the atmospheres of those planets. So that's a really powerful part of J JWST, is to be able to do spectroscopy beyond the imaging. So I'll show you some examples of that when we get to that point. So, what do we need to do? Well, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. It has a main mirror, two and a half meters across. It's a big machine. It weighs about 12 and a half tons and it operates at wavelengths between the ultraviolet and kind of near infrared. It's now 30 years old, still working, everything's fine. Maybe we have a few more years left. At some point, it will drop into the Earth's atmosphere, and we have to think about what to do about that. 
But the James Webb Space Telescope has a main mirror which is six and a half meters across, so close to the, one of those VLT telescopes you saw at the beginning. It's a much lighter telescope. It's kind of a floppy telescope. It only weighs about six and a half tons. And it is at this operating temperature of minus 233. And one of the ways we, one of the things we need to do to make sure it gets cold is move it away from the Earth. It cannot be near the Earth, and it can never see the sun or the Earth. So we have this giant sun shield underneath, which is always in the direction of Earth and sun. And to do that, we sit at a point one and a half million kilometers away from Earth, which puts the Earth and the sun permanently in the same direction. We can put the sun shield, the telescope then gets cold, and we can do the astronomy we want to. So let's have a look at some of the reality of this machine. Well, so first, we've also got all the instruments on the back side and the top there. So we have the main mirror on the front, uh, the big sun shield underneath. We have a big, on the, on the warm side, we also have computers and electronics to send the data back to Earth. So that's, that's, that doesn't get super chilled on that bottom side. But all of the stuff on the top side is down at around 40 degrees Kelvin, so minus 233. So just trivially, this is how the light is collected. It comes from a different object. It's focused by the primary mirror and then by the secondary mirror. These two mirrors are really interesting. They allow the telescope, effectively, one of them is moving constantly, and that makes the telescope stable. It helps keep objects fixed on the sky, even though the telescope itself, because it's floppy, might be wobbling around. Just by moving that third mirror, tracking the movement of a star, you can have super sharp images. And then on the back side, well, I'm out of sequence today because I can't see my talk. Um, so these are just six of those mirrors. Each one of those mirrors is 1.2 meters across. It's made of beryllium, one of the lightest metals that has a gold coating on the surface, very thin. Each one of those mirrors only weighs about 20 kilograms. They're incredibly light. It's all been sculpted out on the back. They're only very thin on the front surface, but they're very rigid and they work extremely well at low temperatures. And then you put all 18 of them together with a, obviously a hole in the middle to let light through. And this is in testing at Goddard Space Flight Center in the US. And you can see, of course, that it's curved. You often see pictures of it looks flat, that mirror. It's not. It has to be a curve in order to focus the light. So this is a big, ri very rigid system, but very lightweight. <clears throat> Here are the four instruments which we have on board. We have cameras for the near-infrared and the mid-infrared, and we have spectrometers for both of those wavelengths as well. So we have um, the camera in the bottom right-hand side, which you'll see most of the images from, and the big thing at the top there, about two meters across, is the European spectrograph uh, called NearSpec. And then the mid-infrared instrument is between the European Space Agency and NASA, and the Canadians supplied another camera, and they also supplied this really important guidance system that allows us to keep the images very stable. So just to show you how one of these things work, we've got all of the examples. This is just MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. This is how it takes pictures. The light comes in from one side. It's reflected from some mirrors to start getting it ready and bending the light around. It goes through a filter wheel so we can select just a certain color of light, certain wavelengths, then we take another picture, we take another picture at different wavelengths. We don't take color images at one time. We take one wavelength, then take another image, another wavelength, and if we take three of them, we can put them together as RGB. We can make a color picture, if you like. So imaging is quite easy. Spectroscopy, on the other hand, where you have to split the light up into its individual wavelengths, that's a bit more complicated. So here we see the light coming in again. It'll go past the camera unit, which is in the top half. And as it goes into the bottom half, the light then starts getting split up into different channels. Well, I'll just let it speak for itself because it's a bit crazy. So amazingly, that works. <laughs> and what that lets us do, what that lets us do is take a patch of the sky and take each row in that, in that patch of the sky, then we rotate the row around and we split it into different spectra, 
for each row, and then we assemble it all back again at the other end to make a cube, a cube of data. So you, for each position on the sky, you have a full spectrum. And you can say, well, for that point in the galaxy, we see this kind of stuff happening, this point in the galaxy, and so on. So this, this is a really powerful way of taking a picture but having a spectrum for every point in that, uh, in that, uh, in that pixel. So this is showing just one of the instruments being attached to the others. This is the near spec, the European instrument. So these are big animals, big beasts, but very lightweight. This is all made of silicon carbide, for example, which is a really lightweight material, but incredibly stiff, which is what you need uh, to make sure all the optics stay lined up. The instruments that when packaged on the back of the telescope, you can see on the left-hand side being dropped down on the back of the telescope. The telescope's facing down onto the floor at that point. So this is all assembled and then has to be all tested at low temperatures. So it was put into this huge chamber at Johnson Space Center in the US. This is actually where the Apollo space modules were tested in the 1960s. Um, and that, so that chamber is big enough for the whole of Apollo. But now we put the James Webb Space Telescope in there. The, the chamber gets to minus 233 Celsius. So down to those temperatures we need to operate at. And for months, it sat in there. And we ran all the instruments and checked all the optics, made sure everything was good uh, for launch. But then we had to attach this big thing, which is the sun shield. And you can see how large that thing is. Look at the people on the cherry pickers there. That is roughly the size of a tennis court, 22 meters long. And of course, that has to be folded up before we go into space, just like the telescope. You can see here the telescope is partly folded up. And we need to package all of that to get inside the rocket fairing. So all of that was put together and then shipped on a, on a, on a ship, a literal ship, through the Panama Canal and down to French Guiana. And here you see it on the left-hand side in its launch configuration with the sun shield folded up, all of the layers, those five individual layers pulled together, the whole telescope pulled together. And then in the middle, the Ariane 5 main core stage, and then with the solid rocket boosters on the right-hand side there. So this was November, December 2021. Um, I was lucky enough to be down there to see the telescope in November and then also on Christmas Day uh, to see the launch. So I'm going to show you the launch now. This is a piece of a video, a longer video you can find online, um, which is a kind of a documentary about the, the launch of JWST. And uh, this is where I'll ask somebody to bring me some water, because I get quite emotional when I watch this. If we could just make it as loud as you like. Liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself, James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. As I say, Christmas Day, right? What a way to spend Christmas Day. I was, if you, if you may have seen me, bold guy in the middle of one of those shots, so it was a good place to be. Um, so yeah, we had to launch and then, of course, then the telescope had to get into space and one of the first things that had to happen, we had to unfold the solar panel on the back of the uh, observatory to get some power. We were only on batteries and we only had a few hours on batteries. So this is the last shot taken of the telescope from the top of the Ariane 5. There it is all folded up. This is faster than real time. It's about five times faster than real time. That's Somalia and the um, uh, Gulf of Aden down there. And then you'll see now the solar array open up. And this was a moment where people really cheered because we knew we had a space mission at this point. Without that, we were dead. But that all worked perfectly well. I don't know. That's as good as some of the graphics in EVE, right? I mean, 
<laughs> but it's real, it's real. <laughs> So this point where we, where we needed to get out to, the L2 point, which is one and a half million kilometers away, as I say, it keeps the Earth and the Sun always on the same side of the observatory. Gravity balances out there in a way which is very clever. Uh, it still follows the Earth around. It doesn't get further away from the Earth, but it enables us to be stable as we orbit around and we keep the Sun Shield pointed towards Earth and the Sun. The telescope on the other side is looking out into the darkness of space and we can get down to that temp those really low temperatures. Now we need to unfold it. This is the 15 second version. All right, I could spend the three hour talk on that, but um, all incredibly complicated. It took about a month. Every single piece had to work. There were lots of single point failures in there, particularly the sun shield. If the sun shield did not deploy fully, then we would not have a mission because the telescope would never get cold, the instruments would never get cold, we'd never be able to see a thing. But it all worked. We were able then to, again, orient the telescope pointing towards the sun on the right-hand side, uh, the, the sun shield, and then the telescope looking out into space. It looks sideways. It doesn't look away from the sun and the Earth. It looks sideways, but it looks into the dark. So it's an incredibly um, sensitive um, uh, telescope because the background is really low, it's huge, it's cold, everything works extremely well. And the main thing was to get all of those 18 mirrors to all line up to act as one mirror. And that happened in March 2022. So from March 2022, once we had this image, which, me, which we could read all the parameters of and know that all 18 segments were working perfectly, we could start taking science data. So I have about 15 minutes left, I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of what we have, but there's more every day. This telescope is now just producing floods of data. And in the next few months, lots of data will start becoming publicly available. There's a lot already publicly available. But after one year after it's taken, all data becomes public. And because we're roughly a year after launch, after, after first science at least, then you'll start being able to see uh, much more data in the archives, all completely available to you. So here's one of the early images that are released. It's a big star-forming region called the Carina Nebula in the Southern Hemisphere. These are all optical pictures taken from the ground, and we're only able to see a small piece of the sky with JWST. So as we zoom in, we get closer and closer to this region where young stars are being born, and you can see on the right-hand side here a place where there's there's hot gas on one side and cold gas and dust on the other. This is an old Hubble Space Telescope picture, but now with the James Webb Space Telescope, we see in there with much more detail. And because we're in the infrared, we can actually see young stars forming in that gas and dust on the bottom. So as we just kind of zoom in a little bit, because these images are enormous, they're many thousands of pixels, tens of thousands of pixels in many cases. As we zoom along, along the edge of this cosmic cliff, as it's been called, you'll see a place in the middle here where there's a, a young star being formed with this kind of jet, this kind of material flowing away north and south, not visible at all to the Hubble Space Telescope. These are the short wavelengths for the JWST. We can also go to longer wavelengths, out to wavelengths between about 5 and 30 microns, 5 and 30 micrometers. And that's what the MIRI instrument does. So it's the same region again, but we kind of now see those young embedded stars shining brightly in red. They're only being seen at the longest wavelengths. They're cool, they haven't started fusing hydrogen yet, then they're only a few hundred degrees, and they give out light in the infrared. Now, a few months ago, or yeah, a couple of months ago, this was the first anniversary image. This is another star-forming region in a place called Roafuki. And there's, in this picture, as well as this big reflection at the bottom, there's this enormous jet of material coming out in both directions, to the top right and the lower left. And you can see a dark shadow two-thirds of the way along. And right in that dark shadow is a very young protostar, something that might be only 50,000 years old. And as it's accumulating material, and it's surrounded by gas and dust, so we can't even see it with JWST, it's ejecting material out at high speeds as well. It's a bit like a baby, right? You, you put stuff into a baby, and some fraction of it comes out again at high speed, right? Um, so that's exactly what happens in star formation. We get these big jets of material coming out. They're a really big thing that we want to try to understand better. Now, we can also see the planets in our own solar system. This is Uranus. 
And Uranus, we've known for a long time, has rings around it, which we see, and we see its moons very clearly here. We are also seeing deeper into the atmosphere that you can see at visible light. Uh, we can see down to depths of hundreds of kilometers in the infrared, and we can see different structures in this gassy atmosphere. The same is true of Neptune. And you can see here Neptune, which is basically just boring and blue in, infra in visible wavelengths. In the infrared, we can see hot spots, which are high up in the atmosphere. We can see cooler parts. And then we can see hotter stuff even deeper into the atmosphere as well. So in infrared, we can see much more detail in the atmosphere of these planets. And we also see that it has rings, which we knew. So ringed planets are more common than not, actually. We always thought it was just Saturn, but Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter has rings, Saturn has rings. Everybody has rings except us, actually. But we've just made an artificial ring uh, with satellites. So but we got there in the end. Now, those are planets in our own solar system. What about planets beyond? So this is an artist's impression of an exoplanet. This is a planet orbiting around a distant star. It's very hard because they're so close to the star and they're so far away. It's going to be very hard to take direct pictures of planets in most cases. We, we will see some with JWST, which are quite far away from their stars. But in most cases, what we're going to rely on is the fact that sometimes planets go in front of the star between us and, uh, so the planet goes between us and the star. And as it does that, some of the light of the star is absorbed by the atmosphere of the planet, if it has an atmosphere. So we call that a transit. As the planet moves in front, it absorbs some of the light. And because if it has an atmosphere, some light will be absorbed more strongly at some wavelengths than others. A bit like our own atmosphere. If there's water in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, some of the infrared light will be better absorbed than other wavelengths. And that's what you can see on the bottom. That those different colors indicate different wavelengths being absorbed differently. And we can turn that into a spectrum. We can actually see the chemical composition of an atmosphere by watching these transits. So we see CO2, we see sulfur dioxide, we see water, we see sodium, we see carbon monoxide. And so we're beginning now to measure the atmospheres of distant worlds going around other stars. I mean, I know you guys can go there and actually look for real. We can't quite do that yet in astronomy, so we have to use this indirect technique. But we, there is a real hope now that we're beginning to look at planets which are like the Earth, terrestrial-like planets, and we can start to measure their atmospheric properties. And maybe with this observatory or a future one, we'll be able to see signs of life in the atmospheres of those planets. So one of the most famous places that Hubble looked at were the pillars of creation, as they were called, in the mid-1990s. And of course, James Webb Space Telescope went back to look at those. It can start seeing in the gas and dust of those pillars. But of course, it also has much bigger detectors than Hubble had back in those days. So if you actually look at the full image now that JWST has seen, we see the pillars and where the big red patches are. Those are the places where young stars are being born inside these light year long pillars of gas and dust. And so again, with the infrared, we're able to look in a different way than Hubble was able to do before. And we can also go to longer wavelengths out into the mid-infrared. And if we do that, they take on a very different appearance. Now they become something out of Harry Potter, I think. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But so we're now seeing the gas and dust illuminated from outside by the ultraviolet radiation from the big massive stars, which are out of the picture here. And we're beginning to see all of the gas and dust in a different way. And that's really useful to us, because we're really interested in looking at how much gas and dust is being turned into stars in other galaxies. Here's this giant spiral galaxy. This is a visible wavelength picture with Hubble. If we go now to the new JWST picture, then we see the places where the stars are being born. So all the dark stuff, the gas and dust in the, J in the Hubble picture now starts glowing. So we're able to start measuring how much of that material is being turned into stars. And then we know also that galaxies don't form on their own. They often form in giant clusters. At the beginning, I showed you the large and small Magellanic Cloud in orbit around our Milky Way. Well, this is a giant cluster of galaxies called the Stephens Quintet. There are five galaxies in that picture, four in a row on the right-hand side and one on the left-hand side. The one on the left-hand side actually isn't in that cluster at all. It's in the foreground. And if we zoom in, you'll see why. 
you can actually see individual stars in that galaxy on the left-hand side, little points of red light. That tells us it's much closer to us than the other ones. So this is just a chance alignment of, those, of that galaxy with the ones on the right. The ones on the right, on the other hand, are interacting with each other under gravity. They're orbiting around each other. They're pulling material out of each other. And that material gets heated up. And the red stuff you see there is forming new stars. So even on the galactic scale between galaxies, we see new stars being born in empty space between the main galaxies themselves. And then we can look in again at the, the longer wavelengths in the infrared. And we can see in the top galaxy, there's something red just appeared there. And that red thing is gas and dust streaming into a black hole. We can't see the black hole directly, but we can see the heated material just before it falls in. And we can split that light up, and we can take a spectrum of it with JWST. We can see that there's iron and argon and sulfur, all of the basic elements, but also molecular hydrogen gas, which is at a very different kind of temperature. So we can actually figure out what's going on in the region around the black hole. We can split it in different ways and make images in the different species. So this is a really powerful tool beyond the images to actually start being able to do the physics and the chemistry, which is what we want. Now, one of the main goals, of course, of JWST was to look at the most distant galaxies. And so this is the, the, one of the first images that came out. This is a galaxy cluster in the foreground, the white stuff, and then the stuff beyond, the red and yellow stuff, they're galaxies at much greater distances. And their light is actually coming past the foreground galaxies and being bent by gravity, which is why you see all these curves and arcs. This is called a gravitational lens, and so the big the mass in the foreground galaxy is bending the light from the background one. And we can see over this image all these galaxies further and further and further back in time of get again. We see these very weirdly distorted ones. That's just the effect of gravity. You're looking through a weird lens, like a, a kind of a mirror funhouse. Then it's not what they really look like at all, but the gravity is distorting their light. The gravity also makes them look brighter. So we can see fainter objects than normal if there's something to amplify the light, these gravitational lens. So that one field has now been joined by many others. And the famous one, again, I go back to is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which Hubble made uh, back in the uh, starting in the mid-90s and keeps adding data to now. But it's a very small piece of the sky, as I said. It's just this one grain of rice at arm's length, a tiny piece of the size of the moon. And yet there are thousands and thousands of galaxies, each with billions of stars. So let's put that in context. Hubble has also surveyed a bigger area around that. Not as deep, it hasn't taken as long, but it can go wider. And it's also drilled down even further and made a much deeper image. This is the deepest image now, uh, which we had before JWST. It took about a month of time to get, and if we look at the new image that's been taken by JWST of exactly the same area in a few hours, and we compare them. So the top image took a month to take, the bottom image took about three hours. So we've only just started with the James Webb Space Telescope in terms of our ability to measure the faint galaxies. Once we've spent days and weeks, we'll be able to go much deeper and see, hopefully, these very first galaxies that ever formed in the universe. But to really nail down how far away they are, we're going to need to make a spectrum of each one. So this is another field which we've been measuring with JWST called the Sears field. And in there, there are lots of faint objects, and people have been searching for the ones which might be candidates for the most distant galaxy. This is one of them. It was thought to be at redshift 12, which would break all of the records. And when you took a spectrum of it, it turned out that it's pretty close, 11.44. So just the images told us it should be at that redshift, and the spectrum tells us, yes, it is. So that, that's a confirmed galaxy. But in the same field, very close by, there's another one which looks to the naked eye just the same, but it turns out that it's a fake. It's not actually at that distance at all. It's much closer to us, and our imaging selection was slightly fooled. When we took a spectrum of it, we could say, no, that one's nearer. So this is going to take a while. You're going to see some false detections. You're going to see some good ones. You, this is a game which is going to go on for many years yet. There's no big discovery at the beginning which says, hey, we've solved it. We've solved the way the universe works. So it's going to take a while. Stick with us. 
But as I said at the beginning, you know, these projects take an enormously long time. So I just want to finish. I'm right at the end. I just want to finish with a personal note. So I came into this game, infrared imaging, right at the beginning. When I started as a, a young astronomer in 1982, as a PhD student, the only way you could take images in the infrared was by having a single pixel and scanning it across the sky. Move the telescope and scan backwards and forwards and make a picture one pixel at a time. Man, it was boring. By 1986, we had the first detectors which could actually take real images. There are only 4,000 pixels in that detector, but that's 4,000 times faster than anything we had before. So it was a true revolution. It really changed the way we saw the universe, and it led to the James Webb Space Telescope, because without these detectors, there's no point building a big, cold infrared telescope in space if you only have one pixel. I mean, who would pay for that? You want to see the pictures. So that was taken in 1986. It was the first light image, the first picture taken with that new camera, the first one in the world used for astronomy. And I then stayed in infrared astronomy. I went to work for NASA. I moved around. I went to work in Germany for a while, moved in the UK, moved back to work for ESA now for the last 15 years. And throughout all of that, I've been using Hubble. And I became involved in NGST when it was young now called JWST, and I have time on that telescope to take pictures of things and do science. And so you can imagine I was pretty pleased last year when we got the first data, exactly the same little piece, the center of the Orion Nebula. This is purely raw data. Nothing has been done to it. It just came straight from the telescope. It's roughly 20 times sharper. We start to see much more. That's great, but it's just one piece of an enormous image that we've made. And I'm not going to show it to you today. I'll tell you why in a moment. So this is the region that we're actually, we've taken picture of. That's not the JWST picture. That's the region we've covered. And the reason I'm not showing today is because in 10 days' time, it will become public, and you'll all get to see it then. And, and I, w I thought about showing it to you today, but, and, but I woke up at 3.30, and I realized there's lots of very clever people watching online with screenshot on the finger right there. And I thought, mm, sorry, guys, not today. Um, so I apologize, but I'm going to show you one little piece of that survey. See that little dot there? Looks like an ordinary star in the ground-based images. We have such sharp images with the JWST. If you zoom in, it's a young region. It's a young star with a disk of gas and dust around it making planets today just a million years old but being attacked by the hot stars in the middle. So the material from that disk, the dark smudge there, is being lifted away and streamed out into a tail. So we're seeing star formation in action, and the whole of my data looks like that. It's just full of amazing details. So October the 2nd, 12 o'clock, CEST, on our website, the images will be released, and they are utterly stunning. So just to show you that you can be a young person really excited about astronomy or excited about what you do in life, it may take a while, and you may become old and gray, and you all will, I'm sorry, that's the way it works, you will all become old and gray, but if you're lucky enough, you can be involved in something truly, truly amazing, and it's been a privilege to work with 20,000 other people in Europe and North America, and it's been a privilege to come and tell you a little bit about that today. Thank you very much, have a great meeting.